Acts chapter 11, verses 1 to 18. Peter explains his actions. The apostles and the believers throughout Judea heard that the Gentiles had also received the word of God. So when Peter went up to Jerusalem, the, un- the circumcised believers criticized him and said, you went into the house of uncircumcised men and ate with them. Starting from the beginning, Peter told them the whole story. I was in the city of Joppa praying, and in a trance I saw a vision. I saw something like a large sheet being let down from heaven by its four corners, and it came down to where I was. I looked into it, and I saw four-footed animals of the earth, wild beasts, reptiles, and birds. Then I heard a voice telling me, Get up, Peter, kill and eat. And I replied, Oh, surely not, Lord. Nothing impure or unclean has ever entered my mouth. And the voice spoke from heaven a second time. Do not call anything impure that God has made clean. This happened three times, and then it was all pulled up to heaven again. Right then, three men who had been sent to me from Caesarea stopped at the house where I was staying. The Spirit told me to have no hesitation about going with them. These six brothers also went with me, and we entered the man's house. He told us how he had seen an angel appear in his house and say, Send to Joppa for Simon, who is called Peter. He will bring you a message through which you and all your households will be saved. As I began to speak, the Holy Spirit came on them as he'd come on us at the beginning. Then I remembered what the Lord had said. John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So if God gave them the same gift he gave us who believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I to think that I could stand in God's way? When they heard this, they had no further objections and praised God, saying, So then, even to the Gentiles, God has granted repentance that leads to life. This is the word of the Lord. So, um, good morning, and what a um, joy to be in such a beautiful building, and what a a thing to have done all together to do this. Uh, Thank you for the reading, Claire. So... I was in London on the 6th of July, 2007. And on that day, it was announced that London won the bid for the 2012 Olympics. And I remember seeing the newspapers on the tube emblazed with the news, and I felt the excitement. I don't know if you know what happened on the next day. So the next day in London saw the terrorist attacks on the tubes as some young men blew themselves up in the name of radically distorted and warped portrayal of Islam. So this this profoundly affected me um, because I was in London the previous day during rush hour on those tubes. And for years afterwards, whenever I went on a tube in London and saw a young man with brown skin and a rucksack get on the train with me, I felt fear. Something deep in me pushed me to dehumanize those individuals other than and potentially perceive them as a foe. So this is a political philosopher. He's called Carl Schmitt. Uh, I studied him at university. Interestingly, he seems to be coming back into vogue uh, in a bizarre way with our neighbors across the pond. Uh, He lived between 1888 and 1985, and he was a German philosopher and a member of the Nazi party. Now, he criticized 
parliamentary democracy and liberalism, and he put forward a concept of friend-enemy. He argued that any human group can only be held together if it has a common enemy. He is latching onto something and terribly underpinned part of the Nazi regime, this tendency of us to other other people who do not seem like us. Deeply embedded in our psyches is a predisposition to judge other people. Are they in my tribe or not? So this underpinned my feelings on those tube trains, but if we're honest, we have a tendency to do this all the time, whether, we're, whether we consciously realize it or not. We look at how people appear, how they talk, and do they follow our customs and practices of our tribe. I was trying to think of something in our culture of really important practices that we all just accept. And it's quite difficult when you're in the culture because it just seems natural. <laughs> but one thing that came to mind, which is a bit of a silly example, which I think is quite settled in our culture, is the concept of queuing. <laughs> so this, this is a queue to get into Wimbledon. Uh, and it's all very regular and orientated. You'll see the tents down one line. And you'll also see that people are moving their tents as the queue moves along. <laughs> so I think if we were involved in that queue, <clears throat> we'd be quite upset if some people just went down and ignored it all. Uh, and we probably would go as far to think, hang on, who are they? They're not from around here. You know, and just see them as, as other, not, not our tribe. So naturally, the good news of Jesus has something to say about this, as it touches all parts of who we are and has something to say about this tribalism. And this is at the heart of the passage today and also is one of the central issues of the New Testament. So in this part of Acts, Peter has returned to Jerusalem to the early church leaders to let them know about a vision and what happened to him at Caesarea. So you might be able to see on the map where Caesarea is in Samaria at the time. Leading up to this passage was the expansion of the Jesus movement, initially starting in Jerusalem moved out to the surrounding Judea, but then grew in surprising ways the first Jesus followers. We saw in Emma's talk a few weeks ago how it spread north to Samaria. And that's an area where people were viewed with suspicion and hostility by the Jews. The message spread to the Israelites still in exile in the broader Roman world, the diaspora. And then a surprising worldview shaking event took place for these ethnic Jewish Christians. I guess they didn't call themselves Christians. They said they followed the way at the time. Simon Peter had a remarkable vision. He met a Roman officer called Cornelius preached the good news, and even while preaching, the Holy Spirit fell on all those listening. The Jesus message was not just for those early Jewish Christians and those in Judea and those in Samaria and those Israelites still in exile abroad, but also for the non-Jews, the Gentiles, and that's why we are all here today. And we see in Acts 11, what happened? The Gentile, the Christian believers in Jerusalem, they heard what had happened and they were upset. 
And so Peter came back to them to tell them what happened. And so why were they so upset about Peter going into a Gentile house and eating with them, as we see at the beginning of Acts 11? So the Gentiles were seen as other, unclean. Some Jewish sects would go as far to see the Romans as enemies to be killed and attacked. The Jewish faith at that time had rituals and practices to clearly mark them out from non-Jews. Ethnic boundary markers, in effect. Now, you may have known some of them. The food laws, Sabbath, circumcision, being born into a Jewish family. By keeping these, a Jew demonstrated they were part of God's elect. You might say, a cut above the rest, which was actually the case for the males. (laughs) (laughs) The rituals and practices have been in place and practiced for centuries as the Jewish people waited for God to come and make things right, to restore Israel and make all the other nations pay homage to Israel. And it's hard for us to appreciate how deep this was culturally embedded as a natural way of being. I gave the silly example of queuing etiquette and how not doing this is almost taken as offensive on a cultural level in our country. Another thought I had was the way Winston Churchill and events like Dunkirk have taken a mythological hold on our culture. So to question them, even if you're speaking some truths, often brings a sharp reaction. So this, here's Winston Churchill, and that property is Chartwell House. It's a National Trust property, and I work for the National Trust, so I'm just kind of, you know, bigging it up. <laughs> so a few years ago, the National Trust released uh, uh, an in-depth report about colonial connections to its um, properties, and it was like years of academic research. And one of the issues it talked about was Winston Churchill's actions uh, as a politician. So he's not whiter than white, but then, you know, who is? But that caused a sharp reaction in the press to question this deep-rooted picture of who he has grown to be in our culture. So it's understandable why the Jerusalem-based Christians responded the way they did. So Peter then told them what happened. He was staying in Joppa, and whilst praying, he went into a trance and had a vision. He saw a big sheet being lowered from heaven, and in the sheet he saw animals, reptiles, and birds. And a voice then told him to slaughter and eat three times. Now Peter refused, because to do so would make him unclean, those food laws that I mentioned. And at that point, messengers from Cornelius came, and the Holy Spirit told Peter to go with them. So Peter goes to Caesarea, meets this Roman officer, Cornelius, who tells him that Cornelius tells Peter about a visit he'd had from an angel telling him to bring Peter so that he and his household can be saved. So the thing here is God is taking the initiative. He's preparing Peter for this encounter, and he's taking the initiative in preparing Cornelius to call for Peter and to hear the gospel. Now, interestingly, in Peter's account, he doesn't name Cornelius. We get that from Acts 10, just before. And I think Peter didn't want to name Cornelius because he wants the focus to be on Jesus and not on the human personalities. It's such a dramatic thing that happened. 
And Peter says how the Holy Spirit came in a dramatic and recognizable way. And because they received the Holy Spirit, he said they should be baptized because they're now all part of God's family. And so, of course, he should accept hospitality and eat with them. Now, in the commentary that I was reading for this, that was 2,000 pages long. <laughs> it's unbelievable. They translated the end, this, this last bit. And it says that the Jerusalem Christians, listening to what Peter said, said they were silent in response. No more words were said to Peter. I don't know if you've ever had one of those moments when God has shown you something new, altered your perspective, or you've heard someone speak prophetically. Sometimes we should just be silent. So how did those Jerusalem Christians respond? Now, to their credit, they managed to let centuries of cultural practice fall away, and they praised God, and they acknowledged that the Gentiles can respond to God and be led to new life in him. So the restoration of Israel, longed hoped for, was not about Israel being reconstituted as a nation state. It was bigger. A restoration of God's kingdom to all nations. The very vision of Abraham as a father to all nations. A spiritual Israel found and constituted within the community of believers. The big move was not just the food laws were no longer a barrier, but Gentiles themselves are not unclean and are not kept at arm's length from God's plan. So Tom Wright, the theologian, said in a letter to the spectator, I'll put the words on the screen, there's quite a lot, so I'll leave that up there, but I'll read it too. In describing the church, which, by the way, is you guys. The church was the original multicultural project with Jesus as its only point of identity. It was known and was for this reason seen as both attractive and dangerous, as a worship-based, spiritually renewed, multi-ethnic, polychrome, mutually supportive, outward-facing, culturally creative, chastity-celebrating, socially responsible, fictive kinship group. I'll tell you what that is afterwards, if you're interested. <laughs> Gender-blind in leadership, generous to the poor, and courageous in speaking up for the voiceless. What a vision. So what do we make of all this? A few points of reflection. God takes the initiative, preparing and shaping who we are, and at the same time shaping others to be receptive to how he will use us to minister to them. The Holy Spirit comes when people respond to the message that Jesus is king and in him is salvation. We don't do this in our strength. Now, I think you know that I lead the Pathfinder Broads Cruise, Christian sailing holiday for teenagers. When I first became leader, I used to think we had to get everything right in terms of music and preaching to get young people to respond to a gospel call. However, I began to see that this is not the case. There is no magic formula you use. God takes initiative and will do things in his way, which is always for the best. So this year on the Broads Cruise, we were running out of time in one of our evening meetings. And I said to God, 
This is probably a bit irreverent. I said, okay, you've got 10 minutes <laughs> to do anything you'd like to do because <laughs> I need to get these young people back to the boats to go to bed. And then a leader stood up and said, if anyone wants to have some prayer to come forward, and that's all they said. And as one, virtually the entire room responded and moved forward. And those 10 minutes were the most astonishing experience of my time on the Broads Cruise. We also need to continually challenge ourselves as to whether we are othering people, seeing them not as our tribe. God reaches out to all. So let's not see any human beings as unclean, but as made in the image of God, who he longs to know. Also, be really wary of people of influence in our society and leaders who blame, who blame problems on people who are different to you. It's so easy for them to appeal to these deep-rooted tribal tendencies in us. Be shrewd and careful of what you let influence you, what you put into your mind. I recognize my need here, but for a start, when I go on tube trains, I need my mind changed. We need to ask the Holy Spirit to prompt and challenge us about structures and practice, practices, the way we do things in our church, which create barriers we might not even realize, like the Jews did to mark out the Gentiles as different. We need to try hard to avoid creating cliques and in-crowds in church and pay special attention to those on the edge. I always found Sarah Couchman inspirational in this regard. What a lovely, kind, inclusive woman she is. We must also be open to people raising issues when something's not right in our church. The past years have seen too many stories where power and churches has gone wrong. So we should listen carefully to those who raise issues. We're also part of the big rescue plan, and God involves us. His kingdom is advancing, and there are no places which are off limits for him. The gospel is transformational, and the Holy Spirit changes how people think and behave, making them new humans. Our inspiration for mission is to know that the Holy Spirit is wanting to reconcile, restore, and transform, which is good for all humans. We, as the church, are an advanced sign of the kingdom that will fully come when God will restore and make all things new. Eating and hospitality is a core part of life as Christian communities. It should be a unifying symbol of all coming together to eat at the same time. So it's great that we're doing communion today. And also we have our community service where we all eat together. Our faith is earthy and rooted. Finally, expect to be challenged by the Holy Spirit, to have preconceptions turned upside down, like Peter and those early Christians, for God to open your eyes to deep, beautiful truths. So this can be scary. <clears throat> and sometimes the proper response to having this experience is to be silent. And then praise God.